We are here at UCLA on February 24th to hear some extemporaneous speaking on the Supreme Court from... My name is Emma Rennick. Hi, Emma. Does everyone have their uh, phones away, computers shut, books shut? Yeah, you're going to time. Good girl. Yeah, Are you good you. with like four minutes? Four down, three, two, one. That means 15 sec 30 seconds. Uh, okay, good. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Three unalienable rights that have been granted to us as individuals by the government. But here in the land of the free, we also value capitalism and big business. So what happens when the rights of individuals conflict with the rights of these big businesses? It's up to the courts to decide to choose between a rock and a hard place as to which rights come first. I'm here today to tell you the story of Peggy Young. Peggy was working for a well-known UPS for several years, and then she became pregnant. She um, received a doctor's note that said that she could not lift more than 20 pounds. However, in her job description, she was required to lift up to 70 pounds. In an interview she had with NPR on December 3rd, 2014, she stated that she only had to lift heavy objects maybe once or twice a month, and she had a coworker who was willing to help her out when those times came about. However, she was forced to leave her job, thus losing her paycheck as well as her health benefits for the nine months of her pregnancy. She stated in her interview with NPR that she had been coded in the system as disabled, though she did not qualify for disability because she could still work. She stated that pregnancy is not a disability, it's not a handicap, it is none of that. So what did Peggy Young do? She sued UPS under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 as well as the Americans with Disabilities Act. Today we are here to look at the implications of the recent Supreme Court case, Young v. UPS. I repeat, what are the implications of the recent Supreme Court case, Young v. UPS? The first implication is that Peggy Young's rights as an individual are not being protected. The second implication is that women, women's rights in general are not being protected. And the third implication is that if Peggy Young does win this court case, perhaps it's UPS's rights and the rights of businesses that are not being protected. Now, you may not be able to relate to this case at this point in your life. You may be able to wonder what it would feel like if you were laid off your job for something that was essentially out of your control. But the thing which all of you should be able to connect to are those three unalienable rights that I discussed earlier. The rights of individuals are on the line, and that is something that you should all care about. The first implication of this Supreme Court case is that Peggy Young's rights are not being protected as an individual citizen of this country. In a article by the New York Times, they took a strong stance that the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 was not adequate to protect Peggy Young's rights, and that's where we should place the blame. The Pregnancy Discrimination Act states that pregnant women will be treated equally in their ability and inability to work. Therefore, Peggy Young should have been treated equally as her other workers. So why did she get laid off, and why did she lose this case in two previous court cases? because technically she was being treated equally. In UPS's policy, it does not mention pregnancy, and therefore, if she had been given the desk job which she asked for, that she would have been treated unequally to the other workers who were had off-the-job accidents, as UPS's policy only protects those who have on-the-job accidents. Therefore, the, po the Pregnancy Discrimination Act that is in place is not laying the foundations for equality. The second implication of the Supreme Court case is that women's rights in general are not being protected. Think of Martin Luther King or Susan B. Anthony and all of the people who are, have worked so hard to create equality in this society. They, this court case implies that women's rights are falling behind. And even though this court, regardless of what the outcome of this court case is, Peggy Young has provided a eye-opening experience for people to understand that women's rights are not where they should be. Companies such as UPS have already changed their policies to incorporate pregnant women into the exceptions for um, being laid off of work. Therefore, regardless of the outcome, she is providing 
the population with information and therefore women's rights are moving in the correct direction. The third implication of this Supreme Court case is that UPS has already won this court case in two smaller courts. Therefore, what happens if Peggy Young does win the court case in the Supreme Court? Media such as NPR, New York Times, and The Economist have all taken strong claims that Peggy Young deserves to have her voice heard and women's rights need to take a step forward in the Supreme Court. However, because, this, because UPS has not done anything illegal, would it be fair to have Peggy Young win this court case? The rights of big businesses need to be protected as well. And therefore, if Peggy Young does win this court case, then it will have very severe implications for what our Supreme Court is going to choose, the rights of individuals or the rights of big business. I'm not an expert in the law or constitutionality, and therefore I'm not going to make a claim as to what I think the outcome of this court case will be. I can't say. However, I can say that it will speak largely to whether our Supreme Court values the rights of individuals or the rights of big business. In summary, the three implications of this Supreme Court case state that Peggy Young, as an individual, has not, is not having her rights met. Women's rights in general have come a long way, but still have further to come. And if Peggy, Young's, Peggy Young wins the Supreme Court case, then the rights of UPS will not have been met. So, when, the, when, the, when our government gives us as individuals the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to pursue a life of equality, and it also gives rights to businesses to pursue legality, it puts the Supreme Court in a place where they must choose equality or legality. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start over here today. Hi, Hi, Millie. Uh, I thought your speech was really well done. You did it in a completely extemporaneous style, and you did the talking, which I'm trying to work on, so it's really good. Thank you. No notes. Yeah, right? Yeah, no good. Notes. So good eye contact. Improvement? Um, I also thought it was really well done, but maybe I would like change your tone of voice a little, like depending mm -hmm. on if you're trying to emphasize something or not. It kind of seemed like the whole time you were in just one tone. Yeah, okay. That's fair, yeah. 6.15. Thank you. Thank you for timing. Let me give you some feedback quickly. We have a lot to get through today. Emma. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can't go wrong with that introduction. A little cliche and corny, but it works for your topic because of the subject matter. Uh, next time I'd like to see you come up with something sexy, juicy, something that really grabs your audience, draws them in, makes them want to listen. Maybe something unexpected, as we've been looking at through the sticky text. Um, I think also, uh, you know, uh, there's a prejudice against big business, and I think you could have played that a little better because there's a, you know, uh, the little guy, the little pregnant woman. Big, big UPS. So, I like the way you turned this and you said, I'm going to tell you the personal story. And I like that very much that you told stories, and so that was excellent. Uh, your sixth statement was good. Uh, I like the way that you had three implications and you, had, you really stuck with the question. Um, it's driving me crazy when people kind of answer the question, you know, they're in the ballpark, but they're not really answering it exactly it was, as it was asked, which is the intellectual precision that I'm looking for. Uh, my suggestions would be, I like, uh, you've heard me say this to others, uh, I'd like to hear the dates of your New York Times and Economists and the uh, NPR. And if there's an author attached to it and something and a qualification, that's even better. We call that argument from authority. And that makes it stronger. This is an appealing case. Uh, to be fair to the UPS, uh, the laws weren't on the books as at the time to protect women and so to 
you know, the way place we make laws is in the legislature, not necessarily in the courts. So this is going to require some judicial activism. Okay, but uh, nonetheless, that's um, what some people want. You know, it just depends whose axe is gored. You know. <laughs> So, your goals were do not pace back and forth. Use varied speed and intensity for your main points. I assume that was from your voice. Even before the speech starts, stand in the power stance and start off strong. How'd it go? Um, I definitely did better the last time with the whole walking thing. Yes. When I get nervous, I kind of move around a lot. So right. I practiced that. I think it went well. Um, I think I guess I need to vary my voice more, and yes. I think I made sure to start off in a power stance so that I could start. Yes, she stance. did. Much improved, uh, Emma, and uh, but work on your vocal variety and and go soft, and don't don't be afraid to stop. Put a silence in there for emphasis, you know. But you did a nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. Volunteer. No volunteers? Okay, good. Let's hear from Celestine O. I did it last week. You already did it. Oh, I didn't record it. Okay. Let's hear from Rachel Frank. No, she's not here. Let's hear from Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Hi. How you doing today? Good. That's good. And here's your, Glenn's giving me a self-evaluation. Yeah. Typed. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's what's the controversy here? No, no controversy. Looking for the sign-up for the extension. He's looking for the sign-up sheet for the extemporaneous. Who has it? I'm showing it up. I'll give it to you next. She'll give it. He'll give it to you next week. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This. You're tall, so I'm. I'm losing your head. Um, but I'm doing the best I can. Okay. There we go. He's managing attention, looking around the room, making sure phones are away, books are away, computers are closed. Uh, communicating respect non-verbally, saying to himself, I respect my audience. Finding friendly eyes near the front and center, saying your name for the love. Start your speech. Hello everyone, my name is Glenn Hassani. Hi Glenn. Hi Glenn. They say I dream too big, but I say they think too small. So this is probably what this one young man had in mind when he was just a furniture seller. The Wall Street Journal reported in October 2014 that a, that a former furniture seller was sworn in on Monday as the president of the world's third largest democracy, Indonesia. And of course, in the, in the course of nine years before he became president, he had political experiences. He became the mayor of this one small town in Indonesia called Surakarta. And five years later, he became the mayor of the capital, Jakarta. But I am today here standing here to answer the question, is Mr. Joko Widodo the right person to lead the country? Again, is Mr. Joko Widodo, this former furniture seller, is he the right person to lead the country? And my answer is yes. But before I go to the three reasons why I believe he's the correct, he's the right person to lead the country, let me give a brief background about this fourth most populated country in the world, Indonesia, and why sh we should care. Because Indonesia is, in fact, halfway across the globe. It's in the afternoon here, and people there are sleeping because it's, it's, an, an, it's an evening over there. But why should we care? The fact is, Indonesia and the United States have a very strong ties which, with each other and has a very historical uh, background uh, between these two countries. Um, in February 2014, um, what the Washington Post, uh, the Washington Times reported that Indonesia's um, military commander, uh, General Muldoko, reported that 
the U.S. and Indonesia has a similar interest in fighting terrorism and regional um, security and also with the ISIS problem. That's just one aspect of Indonesia and U.S. Um, uh, cooperation. And another, another thing is that U.S. and Indonesia has a very huge economic trade. The U.S. Census Bureau reported that in the span of seven years from 2005 to 2014 of last year, the trade between Indonesia and U.S. has increased a lot, from $12,000 million to $19,000 million just last year in 2014. So we have established that the U.S. and Indonesia has a very good ties with each other. And wh whatever happens there actually affects us indirectly. Now, the, oh, there's also one story that p people rarely know, that our current president, <coughs> Mr. Barack Obama, actually spent four years of elementary school in Indonesia. He had a stepfather who was an Indonesian guy, and he had uh, studied there for four years. And um, he was nicknamed, he, had, he even had a nickname uh, in Indonesia, he was called Barry, uh, Barry Obama. So that was just a st side story that people usually, uh, that not many people know actually. And so, I have three reasons why, to believe why Mr. Widodo, Mr. Joko Widodo, is actually the right person to lead the country. First, I believe that because he came from a very modest background, he's a, he's a perfect leader that Indonesia needs right now. Second of all, Indonesia is in, in need of a domestic reform. And lastly, um, his opposition, who ran for president last year, was a very corrupt leader. So let me go to my first point, why Mr. Widodo is actually uh, the right person to lead the country. Mr. Widodo came from a very modest background, uh, unlike other uh, politician or the president before him. Um, he came, like I said before, he was, uh, he was a former furniture seller. His dad uh, owns a furniture store, and um, at one point he just decided to go into politics. So he knows the struggle, he knows how poverty is like around him. He, he can relate to people more. One example is when the Air Asia crashed uh, last year, uh, for a flight from Surabaya to Singapore, he actually went to a Surabaya to comfort the people, uh, the, uh, the family of the victim. And this is something that, uh, that is very rare to see, uh, at least for an Indonesian president, uh, that, that he would come, actually, he would directly go to the people and talk to them. And this is also what he did when he was a mayor uh, for Jakarta. So we can see that he's a very modest president, and which, which is why I believe he's the right person to lead the country. The second reason why I believe he's a right person to lead the country is because Indonesia is in need of domestic reform. A lot of criticism about Mr. Joko Widodo is he lacks um, international relations because he didn't have uh, a lot of political um, experience in that particular field. But then again, uh, if you see the if if you see current condition of the country, it is v it is in need of domestic reform. And Mr. Widodo has a lot of experience with domestic politics. Um, w DW News from Netherlands reported that the country has been plagued with um, corruption for over for, for 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 years now. And Mr. One of Mr. Widodo's campaign is to fight corruption. This is why Mr. Widodo is perfect for the job and which is, which is why he's the right person to lead the country. And my last point is, um, is because his opposition, uh, Mr. Prabowo Subianto, he also ran for president last year. He's a very corrupt leader. And um, to prove that he's, a, he's, he's not a, a very good leader is that he was tied to the 1998 um, human rights violation in Indonesia. This is something that is very close to me, to, them, to my family, because in 1998, my family had to run away to Australia because they were killing people back home in Indonesia. They were killing thousands of people because the president just stepped down, and there was, there was, it was a situation of uh, no political power in place. And, and that's why people started killing each other. They destroyed homes, they destroyed um, uh, vehicles and businesses, and that's why a lot of people had to run away. And I was one of the lucky ones to manage to go away to Australia. And Mr. Prabowo Subianto is tied to this human rights viol violation. And when he lost the election last year, he blamed the 
committee, the election committee, that they actually made of, they made some fraud in the calculation, which is why it's not a very good um, attitude to have in a leader. So I have presented to you three reasons why Mr. Widodo is, is, is the right person to lead the country. It's because he was the one, he's, he came from a very modest background, that, that Indonesia needs a domestic reform, and lastly, because his opposition was a corrupt leader. So if Mr. Widodo was able to achieve his dream, like who would have thought that a former um, furniture seller could be uh, a president of, it, of the largest, third largest democracy in the world? But maybe tackling um, corruption in Indonesia is, is such a far-fetched goal. But then again, if he was able to dream big, maybe Indonesia was a is able to dream big as well. Because if you dream, um, your, your ability to dream is limitless. Thank you. Thank you. 740. 7.40? Thank you. Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Um, so, good job on the citations. Really appreciate it. You had a lot of information and background. Um, the only criticism, I mean, the only like caveat to that is that sometimes there was excessive amounts of information, like going to like a curse of knowledge level. It's kind of like I don't need to know Obama's nickname in order to make a judgment about this Indonesian president guy. So, simple that. Because it comes with, I mean, it, it, it comes from having good information because your information is better than, you know, the citations are better than most of the other speeches, but it, it almost went too far in the other direction. Thank you, Benjamin. Prove it. I'm Nina. Hi, Hi Nina. Nina. Um, I think one thing about Ben is like your posture and your hand movement. So you had your hand in your pocket a lot, and then this hand seems to move a lot. And so I think you can tone that down and make it so that each hand movement has like a point to it, and that it can emphasize what you're saying instead of just kind of accompanying everything you say. I think it'd be more effective. That's a good point. Yes. Were you aware that you had your hand in your pocket? Yes. Well, why you uh, had a mouse in there, or <laughs> no? You just uh, yeah. comfort. You're just used to it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are your goals listed on this this thing? Is oh, that no, where? Yeah. The, okay. Let me give you some feedback. Uh, thank you for not using notes and making better eye contact, and choosing a topic that is not on the main beaten path, and enlightening all of us about President Joko Widodo. Uh, that was excellent, uh, and I think that. Um, you had a great deal of information, and most of the time you cited the dates. Sometimes you didn't, so remember to give that full credibility and date and year. And if there's a source, do make it so. Uh, I thought, uh, and I, that's why I reached over to my trusty timer, who's now reading and not listening, and uh, and ask her what how far along were you, and you were three minutes and you were still on your next statement. <laughs> Much too long for a setup. And your sixth statement, you just wanted to go on. Uh, and I think this is what Ben's getting at. You had a lot of knowledge and you wanted to share it. Hey, Barry, and he smoked pot and all this stuff. You know, yeah. Okay, fascinating, but irrelevant to, to this furniture seller, right? So... But it was, it was cute and interesting. Um, on your arguments of your main body, um, modest background, and I initially was skeptical, thinking, is a modest background so good in a leader? I don't know. But then you, you tied it to him going to the people that were harmed in the Singapore Air Asia crash, and then it seems to be you linked it to that and to his approval rating, so that seemed to be good. Uh, on the domestic reform, uh, he seems to be well equipped to do that. The DW news wasn't, the date wasn't cited. Uh, same with the New York Times. 
um, loved your personal story, really captured us and got us interested. Your family escaped death, went to Australia. Nice job there. Uh, went over time, sorry about that. And uh, summary, conclusion, and tie back all work pretty nicely. Let's see what your goals were. Are they here? Uh, four pieces of evidence, no ums, and perfect movement in front. How'd it go? Um, um, yeah, I do, I do it a lot. So, um, but, yeah. um, I managed to uh, put evidences. But um, yes. movement, this time I went this way and then I... He stopped there yeah, instead of going over gone. there and then back to center. Also, uh, when you put your evidence in, if you can fully make it, make it and give it full qualification, give it great credibility, that's even better. When you're practicing with a live person, if you have them raise their hand when you use the um, that will get you out of the habit. But overall, you improved except for going overtime, so thank you. What? Did I go next? I uh, if your name is uh, Sammy Kazai, no, okay. Okay, how about. You want to go next? Who's saying. Okay, yeah, let's go next. Yeah. Is four minutes. Four minutes means it's 3.15. Away that evil phone. Can you just do like every minute? Every minute, yeah. And is it just like you just do each number when it hits that number? When, like, for six minutes left, it would be that. Uh -huh. Five minutes left, four minutes, okay. three minutes, two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds. Okay. And then when you get to 10 seconds, I just do that. Okay. Perfect. And we're trying to at 7.15-ish? 7.15. 7.15. Mina stands before you managing attention. He's reading, communicating respect non-verbally, saying to herself, I respect my audience. Fighting friendly eyes, held front and center, say your name, feel the love, stay your speech. Hi, I'm Mina Cho. Hi, Hi Mina. Mina. Alright, so imagine what life is like if you can never see your family again. We come up with these hypotheticals a lot, I think, in life, right? But I'm going to bring it to a personal point. This is what life has been like for my grandpa. My grandpa has not seen his family since he was 16. What happened here was he grew up in northern Korea, and when the two countries were separated into two, and between South Korea and North Korea, it meant that he moved down to the south, meaning that for the rest of his life he hasn't had any connection, hasn't been able to see any of his family members, or even know the well-being of any of his family members for the last approximately 60 years of his life. So. This is a common struggle amongst a lot of Korean families that's happened from the separation of the two countries. And so this is why I'm here to, today to ask the question of whether or not peace and ultimately reunification of the two Koreas is uh, on the horizon. Once again, I repeat, is the peace and reunification of the two countries on the horizon? Will it happen in the near future? So there's three reasons as to why I believe that peace between the two countries, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen anytime soon. The first reason being is the fact that there is too much of a widening, constantly widening economic gap between the two countries. The second reason being is that there is a growing apathy among the younger generations of South Koreans. The third reason why the reunification and ultimate peace of the two countries is improbable is the fact that the North Korean government is radical and uncooperative, and honestly, you really don't know what they're going to do next. So let's take a step back. Why do you guys care? Why am I trying to give you this speech so that you guys can have an opinion on why this issue matters? Because like I said, for me, it's personal. There's a reason why I should care. But for you guys, most of you aren't Korean, most of you might not go to Korea, and most of you don't really have a vested interest, right? But there's a lot of reasons why it's important. 
But with one of the reasons being is that South Korea has quickly evolved to be one of the most politically and economically uh, growing countries in the world. They have a lot of power, stronghold, influence in this world. And so whatever affects them should ultimately affect us as a country and also individually. Secondly, let's not, be, let's not beat around the bush. North Korea is at the center of many scandals, whether it's missiles and, and, and bomb threats, whether it's Sony, whether it's all these different things. They're this radical superpower, quote unquote, that we kind of hear about a lot. And so whatever affects them should affect us, especially when terms like nuclear bomb threat is kind of being thrown around. The other thing too is that it's just a matter of in North Korea, a lot of people are actually under a lot of social injustices. They don't get freedoms, they don't get the benefits of life that a lot of us are experiencing. And if we care about the goodness of people out there, we should care about that issue as well. So, let me tell you why, once again, that peace between North and South Korea is not on the horizon. The first reason being is the fact that there's a widening gap between the two countries. Um, if, uh, according to uh, Alistair Gale's uh, Wall Street Journal article published on November 6th of 2014, the average income of a North Korean worker is about $1,300 a year. If you compare that to the numbers of South Korean employees who are averaging $26,000 a year, you see how that gap is extreme. Uh, we're talking about 25 times the amount that one person is making more than the other. So when these two countries come together, not only is there a big economic gap, but there's a big cultural gap in how you live your life and what you're used to, and then also in terms of what you're being trained to. A doctor in South Korea compared to a doctor in North Korea, the technology and the knowledge that they have is on completely different extremes. Also, given the fact that according to um, Andre Lanko's article in Al Jazeera published November, 6, November 15th of 2014, he cites that a reunification of the two countries could cost anywhere from $200 billion to $1.2 trillion. This is an extreme amount of money, and let's face it, based on where the countries are economically, South Korea is going to carry most of this burden. A burden which any country doesn't really have the affordances and the means to pay this right off the bat. The second reason why I'm going to argue today that the North Korean and South Korean unification and, and, and coming together in peace is not on the horizon is because of the growing apathy in the younger generations of South Koreans. So like I said in my first point, because South Korea would be uh, the one that's kind of financing this reunification, a lot of the impact and influence is from them. Well, my grandpa's generation and older generations have a vested interest. They feel like the North Korea people are their brothers and they have this unity and loyalty, the younger generations don't really feel that as much. They don't feel that sense of loyalty. They only have grown up with this country being a burdensome neighbor that causes them stress, grief, and basically wastes a lot of their money. Like I said, in Andre Linko's article uh, published in Al Jazeera in November 15th of 2014, um, it's going to cost anywhere from 200 billion dollars to 1.2 trillion, which is too much to spend on a burdensome neighbor. Ultimately, the costs don't outweigh the benefits. Now let's go to the third point and why the reunification is improbable and why peace on the horizon is not really likely. The reason why this is is because of the radical nature of North Korea. Now we've recently seen the Sony uh, uh, hack scandal that happened, but more than that there's missile threats. Missile threats that even the most recent one happened on February 13th of 2015, which is just about a week ago. Published. Uh, this is cited in an article that was published by Scott Snyder on Forbes, once again on that same day, and it's because because these missile threats are constant, they come every week, every two weeks, and it's like you can't really take a country like this seriously and cooperate with a country who's so uncooperative on their own front. Also being the fact that right now South Korea, or North Korea, according to um, David Brooks of the New York Times uh, on December 11th of 2014, cites that they have over a million men in their standing army. Now you have to kind of think about the regime and the ideas behind the government on why they would have a million men ready for battle at any given point. What are they planning? Why are they going to be cooperative? And why are they investing so much into military forces? Because all these, of all these radical measures, it points to where their ideas are in terms of what their future is to hold. So 
To summarize the points on why South Korea and North Korea are not likely to have a reunification and peace, it's because A, there's a widening economic gap, two, the younger generations are uh, apathetic, and three, the radicalness of the government in North Korea. And what this means ultimately is that there's no, there should be no room for doubt in this room that the reunification is not going to happen. I wish I could say different from my grandpa, but I can't. And so peace doesn't seem like the case. Thank you. Thank you. 714. No. Oh. Dang. Okay. We're somewhere over here. Um, you Start with your name. Yeah, hi, Emma. Hi, hi, hi Emma. Emma. I really like how you make this personal about your grandpa. Like, and you even said that it's maybe not personal to us, but the fact that it's personal to you makes it more connected to us. And I thought that was really strong. And also, all of your evidence excited really well, which I thought made you great. Thank you. Yeah. Improvement. Hi. My name is Miriam. Um, Hi, Miriam. Um, I don't really have that much improvement. I felt like you were very relaxed, and I could see that you felt like you made the speech very engaging. Like you knew your topic, but you didn't sound like an expert, like turning out the facts. Like you kind of made it, you made it very informal, and I kind of like you. Like I think you were talking directly to me, like to the and I like that. Thank you, Miriam. Yes, uh, Mina, uh, great improvement over your last uh, speech. Better eye contact, no notes. Uh, I like the grandfather introduction. I was a little nervous at how much time you said in the setup and your intro and background. You, you were about three minutes on that, but uh, you set it up well, and it was very thorough, and that was good. I thought in particular you did a good job of selling this tough topic to uh, the audience. Because let's face it, uh, North Korea, South Korea, it's way over there and we're here and, you know, uh, in Hollywood having a ball, you know, it's the Academy Awards and all that good stuff. Well, on your uh, main body, I love the way that you repeated your thesis each time. Did you notice she did that? She said the first reason that reunification isn't on the horizon, the second reason it's not on the horizon. So her points just had to be on point, and that was excellent. You quoted the author in the Wall Street Journal, the author in Al Jazeera, not one of my favorite sources. Um, <laughs> And uh, that was good. Um, it showed a balance, so, you know, kidding aside. And um, your second point, I think uh, the older, the younger, and the Lankoff article previously cited was good. Your third point, um, the hack of the Sony, the thing, was good. And I think the, mil the military... Uh, threat, a, hundred, a million people under arms, and there's some new stuff saying that they have new multi-war heads that they're aiming at California, and new, new rocket technology, so it's getting pretty scary, really. Uh, and this is why we, we really want to, you know, tamp down on nuclear proliferation. Your summary was good. Your conclusion and tieback were all fine. You were under time. When you watch yourself tonight on YouTube, you're going to see you do this. You're still swaying. And so if you can lock your legs a little bit and so you, you're more of a tripod, that would be good. Your goals were to speak clearly, to cite correctly, which you did, and make good eye contact, which you did. How did you feel you went, it went to that? Uh, yeah, I actually didn't get to practice the speech nearly as much as I wanted to, mm -hmm. and so I kind of did a lot on the fly. Mm -hmm. But I think for that, I think it went pretty well. Okay, you did a nice job. Thank you. Okay. Next, another volunteer. How about oh, oh. how about Caitlin Ray? I already did my second one. Oh, I didn't re didn't record it. Okay. How about 
Lee Bandini. Great. Who, who still has a second one to do? Let's go. Oh, these are the zero ones, the zero hours. Okay, good. I called on you earlier. But I know you. Uh, nothing. Okay, good. Your name isn't on here. Do you want four minutes or? Yeah, she got Just the last minute, just, you know, started going like that. I can't even read your writing. What's your last name? Anaya, A N A Y A. Okay, and stay, yeah, you're tall, so if you can stay close to the screen, not to the wall, but, you know, step there, yeah. Uh, let me re-grease the bottom of this and see if I can get you in the screen. Managing attention, communicating respect non verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front and the center, say your name, feel the love, start your speech. Hello, everybody. My name is Gabe. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Gabe. So, uh, growing up, I moved around a lot from uh, California to the East Coast. I actually lived in Asia for a bit, all because of my dad's career job. And for a long time, when I was asked what my dad did for a living, I would respond, doctor stuff. Now that I'm older, I know that he works very closely to make sure that different countries around the world get the, the uh, vaccinations they need and the tools that they need to prevent any potential outbreaks. And growing up, I was, uh, I was getting every single shot possible, and he made sure every single shot was given to me, even if it was some disease that could never affect me. So when I asked my dad, a very self, uh, a self-made man, very proud of himself, and a public health analyst, excuse me, a public health advisor from the CDC and the WHO, is the CDC doing a poor job educating the public about Ebola? He responded, what the hell do you think? The, the answer is apparently they're doing exactly what they need to do. Now there's three reasons why. First, because most of this disease is concentrated in West Africa, and that's exactly where they're spending mil uh, personnel and money. Second, because the United States is not an active country that has a disease. And thirdly, because the, the CDC is doing everything needed to make sure that the United States stays at that level. So I want to take those points one at a time. First off, West Africa. So the disease Ebola started, the Ebola outbreak started in 2013 in uh, Sierra, in, excuse me, in Equatorial Guinea, and then spread to Liberia and uh, Ni other countries such as Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Now in S Nigeria, it's not active anymore, and various efforts have been made to minimize the disease in the countries where it is. But the CDC is doing enough. They're sending many personnel, risking the lives of those personnel in these countries, in West Africa, and educating the public to know what they do. Now in, Af not in Sierra Leone and in uh, other West African countries, people can't always just go on Facebook or go online and see what the symptoms to Ebola are, what uh, the prevention measures are. And there's other th there's little thing details that the CDC does to educate the public, such as when uh, it is custom in Sierra Leone that when someone dies at their ceremony, everyone must touch the disease, or excuse me, the deceased. Now, the deceased who has the disease, in this case, uh, it, it's very, the disease is actually more spreadable post-mortem, meaning when they're touching the, the dead body, uh, they are more likely to transfer the disease over, and contrary to popular belief, this disease isn't spread through air or water or any other conventional means, but mostly by touch, and as I stated, more so post-mortem. Yeah. So, the CDC going into these countries, risking their lives, and educating th this public is more, th more than doing enough to make sure that this disease stays where it is. Now, that brings me on to the second point. Is that when, uh, when I say public, does that mean the American public, the African public? What public does that mean? Well, t most people tend to take uh, public as American public. We're a very American-centric society, even in the other uh, countries in the world. Now, what my father brought, my father brought up a very good point, and through my own research, I found uh, in the WHO World Health Organization database, uh, which uh, updated in July of 2014. 
that the cases in the United, there were four cases in the United States and one death, as opposed to over 10,000 cases in West Africa and over 4,000 deaths in one year alone. So my father brought up a very good point. Why cause mass hysteria in a country where the disease is not active? He said, let me put it to you this way. Anytime someone comes from West Africa from a plane into the United States, they are, giving, they are put into quarantine and given a phone and a thermometer. For 24 hours, they have to report to the CDC every hour on the hour what their temperature is, and they are not allowed to integrate into the public until such a time that the Center for Disease Control has ruled that they are able to, to do so without infecting other people. Now, as he stated, in a, uh, causing, doing anything more, such as putting, com making commercials, making people wash their hands more, is not going to really have any effect in a country where the disease is inactive. So therefore, he says it is more important to concentrate those efforts on places where the country where the disease is active, such as Sierra Leone and Equatorial Guinea. Now, lastly, the the uh, Center for Disease Control is is putting a lot of its resources into making sure that the people who are either going to Africa or coming from Africa are the ones that are getting this information that they need. Therefore, when people, uh, when I asked him, aren't you playing devil's advocate, I asked him if he was at least a little concerned that the only reason that people here knew about the Ebola outbreak was because it was trending on Facebook for about a month. I, he said, absolutely not. Why, why cause mass hysteria if it is not merited in this case? So. Inclusion, I believe that the United States is not, or excuse me, the CDC is not doing a poor job in educating the public about the Ebola crisis because they are firstly putting enough money and personnel in West Africa to make sure that the disease is contained. Secondly, they are not raising, uh, they are not raising any awareness in the United States that doesn't need to be raised in a country where the disease is not active. And lastly, because they are doing everything they can to prevent the disease from spreading to other African countries and to make sure that the disease is never active in the United States. Now, while I hope this never happens, if such a time comes where the disease is active in the United States and there's more than one death, one reported death in the United States, then I'm very sure the CDC will do everything that is needed, the, the necessary steps to stop the disease from, uh, from causing any more harm than it needs to. But until such a time, the, the CDC is doing more than enough to contain the disease and to make sure that the public, the African public, the public that is being affected on a day-to-day -day basis, is educated. Thank you. Okay. 601. What? 601. 601, yeah. Okay, where are we? Somewhere over here? Hi, I'm Kara. Hi, Kara. Um, I thought you did a really good job of, like, being like personable and like just getting information, um, like your tone of voice was really good the whole time. So that's really and you knew what you were talking about. Or so I made you think. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Masood. Hi, I'm Masood. Um, I think you did a really good job. You have a very powerful voice. Um, I think maybe if you like rehearsed it a bit, there would be less uh, stutters. But uh, I don't know you did a really good job. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel, I prefer an outline that you hand me with all seven parts presented. The intro, the thesis, the six Oh, that was statement. meant to be. Sorry, I, I should have organized it better. That, that was yeah. supposed to be the You just gave me the main body. You gave me the substance of the speech and not the summary, the conclusion, or the tieback. And uh, I want, I want, I do that because I want people to have that seven part outline memorized and in their head so they don't confuse it and do it uh, poorly. Um, I like this speech. I thought that there was a little bit excessive reliance on quoting your father. And I guess, you know, you're proud of your father and this sort of thing. And uh, so, you know, he's an expert, and I guess you wanted us to accept him as an expert. And that's fine. And that sounded pretty good. It would have been help. You had a lot of other sources back here, and it would have been nice to uh, quote them in full and give them their full due mm -hmm. in your speech and say, you know, runaway doctors in 2014. I said the WHO database, and like three or four of those sources are from right. there. So I just kind of, yeah, but yeah, I'll do that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it's called argument from authority, mm -hmm. and nothing against your father. I'm sure he's a swell guy. 
but we're learning to make arguments from authority in this class, and uh, we needed to have other authorities other than your father. Um, basically, the case you made, and you started off with this idea that uh, people ask, what does your father do? And it was kind of intriguing because you gave this answer that he gave checked on vaccines, and I thought it was going to be a Jenny McCarthy speech initially, uh, or at least something like, along that lines. And we, we debated that this weekend, so that was interesting. Um, but I would have liked to tie back at the end to, so remember uh, the vaccines and, you know, so we come the full circle. We have that full seven part tie back. See, I, and I, I'm not getting that from you. I'm not getting the full seven parts. Um, your, your main body was solid. Your main argumentation was good. Don't get me wrong. I'm just dealing with the, this, the, this, the form of how you presented it could use some work. Uh, let's see, where were your goals? Do you have goals listed here yeah, yeah. on your self-evaluation? More structure, well, here we go. Your memorization was good. You didn't use notes. That was strong for you. Uh, identify terms better so that the audience is on the same page. Let's, did you think you had a simple enough thesis that the uh, audience knew what you were talking about for the Ebola virus? Like, do what's best in Africa, do minimally to keep the U.S. safe, and do you think you kept your thesis pretty simple? Uh, definitely more so than last time. I don't know if it's yeah. enough, but uh, I mean, yeah, maybe I could have, I hope, I think I said what the CDC stood for, right? Yeah, I hope so. Center for Disease Control. I think everyone knew that. Yeah. What about unexpected? Did you have anything unexpected that either would grab our attention in the beginning or hold it throughout or in the middle grab it again? Did you have, did you structure anything unexpected in this speech? Uh, not that I know. No. Well, well, what I'm after is in the sticky text, you know, we, we go through yeah. the seven step checklist on our speeches to see, to make them more sticky, mm -hmm. see? And I think, and so on credibility, I think you could have built up more credibility by quoting more sources. And I think that um, it wasn't too abstract. I think it was pretty concrete. Mm -hmm. I liked the part about touching the bodies. That was, that was very good. Uh, and uh, stories and more stories, you know, uh, the more stories you can tell, the better. So, you got the job done without notes. I would say I'm looking for structure, and uh, in your final speech, I want to see the seven parts. Thank you. Okay. What was the time on that? 6.01? 6.01, okay. Okay, let's hear from, is Caitlin Ray here? <laughs> you already, oh, I didn't record it, okay. Oh, you didn't go yet, okay. Masood. Masood, yeah, you have a zero, okay, good. Masood, how do you like to be had? Do you want a four-minute warning or like the full seven? Four-minute, okay, full seven. He's managing attention. She's texting, communicating respect non-verbally, finding friendly eyes near the front and center. Say your name. Feel the love. Start your speech. I'm a sued. Yeah. A young black student, Marcus Johnson, tuned in to see the decision of the trial concerning Mike Brown. The verdict was released, and George Zimmerman was found not guilty. Marcus was outraged. He logs on to social media. He sees all his friends are outraged. He gets a couple of invites to some peaceful protests, and he thinks to himself, this isn't enough. There needs to be more. He sees that there's some violent protests going on, and he decides to join in. Now, was Marcus in the right, or was he in the wrong? The question that I will be addressing today is, do the violent protests in Ferguson significantly undermine the peaceful protests? And my answer is no. Repeat the question. 
Did the violent protests in Ferguson significantly undermine the peaceful protests? My answer is no, and I will give you three reasons why. The first reason is because the violent protests brought forth the central media coverage. The second reason is because this, the violent protests led to powerful movements. And the third reason is because the violent protests may have been necessary for an oppressed group of people to get their voices heard. Now, if Mike Brown were a loved one of yours, and the verdict was released, would you have sat there and posted about the issue? Or would you have gone out with your community and fought against this injustice? Now, my first reason was that the, the violent process brought forth its central media coverage. Social media was completely, um, completely filled with this discussion. Classes of race and inequality were engaging in intellectual discussions on the matter. Uh, articles like the Huffington Post were starting to write about it and people were engaging in debate just as I am here speaking about the issue right now. Now, the media is the main source of information for the general public. And if the, if the media didn't talk about Ferguson, the general public wouldn't know and they wouldn't be able to act upon um, the injustice. They wouldn't be able to protest about it, they wouldn't be able to speak out against it. Now, my second reason is that the, these violent protests led to very powerful movements. Many hashtags began to trend, for example, Black Lives Matter, and another one, If They Gun Me Down. Now, If They Gun Me Down was a very powerful hashtag that originated from the media's coverage of Mike Brown. The media portrayed Mike Brown in a very negative outlook. They didn't uh, post any pictures of him graduating or anything that portrayed him in a good way that made him sound educated. It was mostly things that uh, made him look bad. So now, this hashtag came along with uh, two pictures. One picture of a black individual uh, with most of the in state uh, show a picture that showed him that made him look bad. For example, he'd been off with his friends, maybe uh, portraying himself like being affiliated. Or and the second picture is something that makes him sound ed educated, seem um, like caring for kids, caring for animals, anything that would make him look good. And the point was, if they were shot down just as Mike Brown was, what picture would the media use to cover the story? So now my third reason was that these violent protests may be what is necessary for an oppressed group of people to get their voices heard. Now it's important to understand the context of these protests. Mike Brown was unnecessarily shot by a policeman, and the policeman was found innocent. So now, how do you go against such an act, of, uh, such a judgment? You go out, violently protest, and you take it out on the police. What better way to get your voices heard than by raising hell? Some may argue that social media is the best way to, uh, to get your voices heard. Recently, in North Carolina, three Muslim students were killed in a, in a, a hate crime. And at first, the media didn't cover it, but social media uh, was completely um, filled with discussion on the, on the matter, so the media finally was forced to discuss it. However, they did not mention that it was a hate crime, and they rarely mentioned that it was uh, three Muslim students. So my point is that T social media got them to that point, so talk will get you somewhere, but action does need to take place. The Huffington Post cited a mural uh, that was found in Ferguson that said, unless someone like you cares an awful lot, nothing will get better. So it should be clear in this room that the violent protests in Ferguson do not significantly undermine the peaceful protests. And I've given you three reasons why. The first reason was that it brought forth essential media coverage. The second reason was that it brought forth many powerful movements, and the third reason was that it may have been necessary for an oppressed group of people to get their voices heard. Now, if Mike Brown were a loved one of yours, would you have sat there and posted about the issue, or would you have gone out with your community and fought against this injustice? Thank you. Where are we? Here? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Gabe. Hi, hi Gabe. Uh, I think you need to like kind of vary your tone more because you had like a lot of very powerful like one, not one liners but like uh, the parts like how you ended it and everything. But you just kind of seemed like a little tired, and I think it would have been like more powerful if you kind of did more inflection. But uh, cause, yeah, I mean, the content was good. So. Okay, let's go on here. Yeah, I was uh, about to say the same thing. Um, just say emphasize your on name. Oh, so yeah, my my name is Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Yeah, um, uh, you had a really good point, and like I feel like it'll be stronger if you emphasize on some words. Uh, on the tongue, so. Okay, uh, let's <laughs> let's talk about this. Uh, clearly, this was a you were popular. This is this is the popular point of view. I'm not certain that you 
answered the question precisely, which was asking whether violent protest in Ferguson significantly undermined the peaceful protest. And um, uh, I don't it didn't hear much about the peaceful protest. I heard uh, a lot about uh, your opinion about Mike Brown and what needed to be done and so on and so forth. But I didn't hear much about the peaceful protest. So that's my first overarching observation. Um, I like your opening, your your introduction. It was a grabber. Uh, you uh, you related it to Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman and all the usual suspects, and uh, you talked about Marcus Johnson and that somehow just typing in on a typewriter wasn't quite enough, and that you needed to do more. And uh, is he right or not? And he felt he needed to do more. Is he right or not? Uh, and so then you, you, that brought you to the question, which I had you repeat. Uh, does it undermine peaceful protest? Does, uh, and the question is, what does it do for the audience watching this in greater America, seeing places burned down? Uh, in Los Angeles, for example, during the... Uh, riots that happened when uh, this uh, policeman in Simi Valley were acquitted of beating this fella out in Sun Valley, uh, Rodney King. Uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was a lot of burning and looting and those, those shops and stores never came back and people had a lot of disrespect for the movement of law lawlessness, right? So, did that help peaceful protest? Did that help the movement? Did that help the community? I don't know. Okay. Here's your three reasons that you gave. You said the only way to get media coverage is to be violent. And uh, that was your first argument, right? And I suppose you're right. Uh, if it uh, bleeds, it leads is the motto of most nighttime journalists, right? So I guess uh, you're right about that in a way, although I think that's unfortunate. I don't think that's an essential way to go, but I do think that uh, that's that that was a correct point that you do get attention by rioting, but it may be the wrong kind of attention. But again, uh, it brought media coverage, but but again, we're, we're supposed to be talking about peaceful protests, right? Second reason you said great movements branched out roots from violent protest initially and then became nonviolent, I guess your, your point was. And uh, you gave all this stuff about showing Mike Brown to be not a, a thug or a nasty person, but, but, a, but a high school graduate and a big teddy bear kind of guy, I guess you were trying to communicate, right? And what was your point in this, and how did that relate to peaceful movements and violence? What, how, how did that, that part of that relate to peaceful movement and violence? Because uh, the hashtag and the things that began the trend, those were peaceful movements. So they were what? They were, they're, they're also peaceful movements, right? Because they're just on social media, they're not harming anyone. But oh, okay. um, I, I'm arguing that they were originated because, first of all, like these violent protests happened, Finally, the media covered it. The media gave it to the general public. General public decided what to do with it, which is uh, to make these hashtags. Okay, I see. Okay. Um, and then um, your third point was violent protest is appropriate because it's an appropriate measure for oppressed people to have their voice heard. And uh, here you give evidence of. Uh, you say Mike Brown was unnecessarily shot 
dad by a policeman that was found innocent and cleared by by the way you you by the grand jury and cleared by the FBI of having violated his civil rights uh, these were some inconvenient facts that you didn't mention in your story right and um, so I think and you bringing in the Muslim students at Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Tell me, tell me how that was related to peaceful protest. Well, tell me how how you relating that to violence relating to peaceful undermining peaceful protest. Your thesis. Um, because peaceful protest, like uh, going about social media and uh, making these hashtags, it's peaceful, right? So that's what was done about the three Muslim students. Um, there was a peaceful protest going on about it. But however, uh, even when they did get what they want, which was media coverage and for it to be labeled as a hate crime, they yes. did get media coverage, but it wasn't labeled as a hate crime. So I'm saying that social media got... Was it a hate crime? I would argue yes. And I think okay, I see. And what's the evidence for that? Because uh, they went on his uh, personal social medias and there was things that he said against uh, that Islamophobic remarks. And, um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, what I would say, coming down to the end of your speech, I needed a summary, a conclusion, and a tie back. That following more of the format that I gave you to follow, you, uh, the seven part outline. Okay? Are you, you follow me on that? Yeah, uh, what did you say? I wish you had followed it better. Uh, you said there's no doubt in this room the violent protests did not undermine. You, that was you. You repeated your thesis. I've given you three reasons why. That was your summary again. And you, you summarize after giving your conclusion. And then you tie back. Okay, let's go to your goals. Don't be nervous. Don't talk too fast. And try to keep it under seven minutes. How'd it go? What was the time? 435. 435, yeah. How'd it go? Um, I think I the and I keep yeah, yeah. My biggest problem, and, and I think I, I tried to talk you through it, is just um, staying on your thesis about this thing about how violence undermines people, poets, does it or doesn't it. And um, I think you brought a lot of things in that were sort of popular to people now, like the Chapel Hill unfortunate situation, but I'm not sure how it really related to your, to proving your case about violent protests in Ferguson, which is what you're supposed to be talking about. But you got the job done. Thank you. Anybody else have a second extent to do? I'll go, he says. Okay, I'll go. go. Is your name on this? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. This is your second extent? Yes. Right. Okay, he stands before you, they're talking. Do you want like a four minute countdown? Or? Yeah, four seconds. Okay. She's texting, communicating respect non verbally to your audience, finding friendly eyes near the front and the center. Say your name, feel the love, start your speech. Hello, everybody, my name is Hago Mazzei. Hi, Hogo. Uh, and uh, today I'll be talking about a very important issue that's important both domestically and with the foreign policy in our country. But before I start, I'll ask a classic question. How many of you are aware that last year, before the midterm elections, the Republican-led House of Representatives was uh, considering starting the impeachment process on President Obama? Yeah, not, not many of you, but actually it was, it was a very serious thing, and many Republican leaders in the House even thought that they had enough votes to get this passed. But they decided not to because they feared a backlash from uh, if they had a failed impeachment attempt, attempt. And they said they decided this wouldn't be the best course of action to take right before the midterm elections, where they were trying to take over the Senate and uh, strengthen their numbers in the House. Yeah. 
So with that in mind, uh, today I'll be discussing the, the issue of um, whether bipartisan cooperation between President Obama and the Republican-led Congress is possible. Repeat. I'm going to give you uh, three reasons today why I don't believe bipartisan cooperation between uh, President Obama and the Republican Congress is possible. First, the Republican Party has always had an issue with Obamacare. Second, the Republican Party and President Obama have never really agreed on fiscal issues, and th this could be anything w with regards to fiscal issues, starting from education, which is a very important issue, to even uh, to the fiscal issues with health care reform. They've always disagreed. And third, the Republican Party is o consistently always trying to uh, make decisions that they believe are politically correct. With that in mind, uh, um, I um, believe that our country will continue to suffer from this gridlock that's taking place in Washington, D.C. With, with the failed cooperation between President Obama and the Republican-led Congress. But uh, President Obama will do anything possible to get his agenda across, including using many executive orders. And we'll probably be, be seeing more executive orders than ever before between now and uh, January, 2000, January of 2017. 2017. Right. The Republican Party um, hated Obamacare from day one. It was one of President Obama's first agendas. He came into office and he had the benefit of uh, a uh, Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, so he was able to push it through without much resistance from the Republican Party. All they were able to do was filibuster a bit and make a little noise in the House, but not much. But now, the Republican Party has a majority in both the House and the Senate, so they're, they're empowered. According to the New York Times, just a few weeks ago, the Republican Party tried to repeal the bill. This wasn't, this, this obviously, they, they have enough votes to repeal it in the House and the Senate, but this obviously isn't going to be successful because President Obama still has power of the veto, and uh, he's going he's gonna to do that while he's still in office. And the main issue here is the Republican Party isn't really offering an alternative, and therefore there can't really be any cooperation between President Obama and the Republican Party with regards to health care reform. They, if they offered an alternative, there might be some cooperation, but it's not happening there. Fiscal issues are also a main uh, problem with, uh, when it comes to cooperation between the Republican Party and uh, President Obama. Just a few weeks ago, President Obama also proposed a new $60 billion plan to make community college free for uh, all Americans. This would, uh, <coughs> this, would, uh, th this would promote education in our country by, by helping people who ordinarily couldn't afford college and uh, getting them in, in school. But however, the Republican Party came out and uh, wasn't happy about it at all because they weren't, uh, the, President Obama didn't look, look to them before proposing the, uh, his agenda, and they came out and said they're not going to fund it. This, uh, this um, information came out from the New York Times, and many Republican leaders said that this, this plan will never have a chance to pass in the House. And then um, the second fiscal issue that just came about very recently was President Obama's $4 trillion plan, uh, budget plan for, next, for this year. According to the Wall Street Journal, President Obama came out and said that he would like to uh, raise taxes and increase spending in, in a variety of different ways in order to uh, stimulate the economy and, and uh, help out the middle class. However, the, pro the Republican Party immediately opposed this and uh, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy even came out and said at a time that many in this country are still struggling, this, is, this will create even more problems for our country. The third and final issue that uh, is going to prevent the Republican Party and President Obama from cooperating is the Republican Party's insistence on uh, making decisions that they believe are politically sound for their, uh, for their future, including the 2016 presidential and, uh, elections and, and uh, other elections coming up. Just, uh, just recently, President Obama has... has um, He's issued immigration reform and other reforms by using executive orders. They, they, uh, 
that he was able to push this through, but the Republican Party was very angry about this. So, um, according to the LA Times, this is what actually spurred the, uh, the talks of impeachment in the first place. And they obviously didn't go through with that, but the Republican Party is, uh, they're, they're getting in the way of President Obama making reforms, and most of the reason for this is they don't want anything that would make the Democratic Party look good, and they want to have as much power as possible in Washington, D.C. In summary, I showed you three reasons why cooperation between the Republican-led Congress and President Obama is something that's not going to happen. First, Obamacare is an issue that, that nobody seems to agree on on Capitol Hill. Second, fiscal issues have never been agreed on since President Obama took office. And third, politics are a major issue and partisan uh, politics aren't something that we've seen in the past six years. With that in mind, President Obama has made uh, many helpful re reforms that have helped our country, but uh, such, such as immigration and healthcare. However, m these, um, <clears throat> however, despite this, the Republican Party probably won't work with him with a uh, with, probably won't cooperate with him and they're going to make it difficult and he's going to need to rely on executive orders. Thank you.